What's up, guys? I'm Emerald Marie, and be sure to check us out on the web at realfansrealtalk.com. This is your African King's Come, Michael Blackson. You're watching Real Fans Real Talk. Get real with it, my son. What's going on, guys? Legend of Two Games, repping for Real Fans Real Talk. And I wanted to give you guys my rapid reaction to episodes one and two of The Last Dance. 10-part documentary series following the Bulls around back in 97, 98. And obviously, they just hit us with the first two episodes, which are really well put together. I really enjoy it. I ain't gonna front the um, the audio and the mix it in the 80s hip-hop to uh, match the era of, obviously, Mike coming into the league. But there's a couple of things I wanted to get into um, that they highlighted and that maybe they didn't go into too much detail about. Just give my opinion on just my thoughts. Um, again, drop a like, drop a comment, drop a rebuttal if you feel you know, you got a better point of view on it. Um, also, make sure you head over to Real Fans Real Talk. Follow the page there. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, check out the website as well, man. But with that being said, let's jump right into it. So in episode one is one of the things that I've, I've highlighted several times when I talk about why, in my opinion, Michael Jordan is the best basketball player to ever play the game. Um, and you heard it from guys like Walt Clyde Frazier. Mark Eaton talked about it as well. Um, Bulls GM Rod Thorne had talked about it. Um, David Falk, who was Michael Jordan's agent, had mentioned it. At the time when Michael Jordan was drafted, there was no thinking of building your franchise around a perimeter player. In this case, a guard. Um, you heard everyone say it. Um, no one expected him to reach those heights. But more importantly, even guys who played the game like Clyde Frazier and Mark Eaton all had said, you know, he's, he's a good player. But at 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, you know, you would have to be a seven-footer to really dominate and really be able to carry a team to great heights. So I always highlight that point because I think sometimes it gets lost um, as time has gone by. And we see it even now. To draft a guard early in the draft is, is common theme now. You never think twice about it. You, you compare them to any other great guard that's come before them and you kind of expect great things from them. But at that time, you still took the big man. You still went after the big man because it made sense. Um, and that's why the Portland Trail Blazers took uh, Sam Bowie over taking uh, Michael Jordan. Um, so, and, and even up until a few years ago, that was still kind of common theme. I mean, we saw a draft where Greg Oden went before Kevin, Gar uh, Kevin Dur Durant, I should say, um, so it, it's, it's one of those things and it's one of those, um, mindsets that slowly has changed and evolved as the game has evolved. But I always highlight that because I think a lot of times people forget that the greatness of Michael Jordan, uh, became an acquired taste. That wasn't something that everybody in the league or everybody who followed the league expected it to be. A lot of people didn't see it coming. And that's why when it came on as it did, people appreciated it so much because it kind of came out of nowhere. Um, but with that being said, you know. It is what it is. They took Mike. We know what Mike became. Um, another thing that I thought was very interesting in the first two episodes was the underlying turmoil that Mike had to deal with. We saw early on in his career um, when he broke his foot in the second year, and GM Jerry Krause was already kind of positioning himself to tank and want to add on a better draft pick, and Mike kind of was butting heads with him already at that time. Um, I find that unique because it's something that I didn't remember about that time, but obviously it took place. And I find it unique because we kind of live in an era where we want our athletes to go out on their shield. We want them to try to play through any little injury. We want them to try to play their hardest to win games for their team and their organization. And so to know that early on in Mike's career, these things were going on, these underlying turmoils and these underlying rifts were happening, um, I think even makes it more special what they were able to accomplish in Chicago. Um, you know, the... Episode two kind of jumps back and forth to highlight the mindset and the feelings around the organization. So to know that for 13 years there, for most of that 13 years, I should say, there was always this underlying Jerry Krause with his own agenda, Michael Jordan with his own agenda, Phil Jackson getting caught in the middle of that, Scottie Pippen also getting caught in the middle of that. For all these things to be going on and this organization to still find a way to win six championships in eight years truly speaks to the greatness of the team. Um, obviously Michael Jordan being the face of the team, but for those guys to be able to put all that to the side and be able to continue to win um, and win year in, year out speaks to how great that that team was. Um, and the third thing I wanted to highlight, and I didn't want to get too much into it because I, I think it will be spoken in, in greater detail later on in the series, 
is the Scottie Pippen um, contract situation, which it, it sounds crazy to think that he was the 122nd uh, highest paid player in the league. Um, this day and age, I mean, that's a role player on most teams. Um, you know, a guy who, who's getting paid that low in comparison to the top guys is normally probably a fringe starter, maybe your fifth best starter or a guy coming off your bench in most cases. So to know that Scottie Pippen, who was the second best player on the dynasty, he was voted one of the 50 greatest players of all time, was that um, was so low paid. It is a little shocking, um, but I don't want to get too much into it. But I also think his underlying issue with the organization and Phil Jackson will be shown at some point in this series. Um, I don't want to ruin it again because I don't know when it may get shown, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it will be. The issue with Scottie Pippen and the organization went deeper than just a contract. Uh, there was an incident uh, that took place actually on the court uh, during one of those Michael Jordan retirement years that I think they're going to speak about and it's going to highlight the issues that Scotty was having with the organization and the lack of respect he felt he was getting from the organization and the coaching staff. Uh, but ultimately, I think the first two episodes are great. Uh, for those of you that weren't able to grow up watching Michael Jordan, like I was able to, you know, you get an opportunity to see him now and you get an opportunity to see what he was able to do on the court. The numbers is one thing. Seeing the numbers on paper, yes, it pops out to you. But to see the moves, to see what he was able to do against the competition, knowing that every team was gearing up to stop him and they couldn't, 63 points in a playoff game against a Boston Celtic team that a lot of people consider one of the five greatest teams ever, uh, for him to do that when they're gearing up their whole defense to stop him speaks to the, to the type of basketball player he was, man. And I hope you guys keep enjoying it. Keep tuning in. I'll be back next week. Um, with a recap for episodes three and four in between time i'll drop some uh, some sports debates like we've been doing man but keep tuning in legend of two games real fans real talk you guys stay safe stay indoors what's good it's your boy daylight you're now tuned in with real fans real talk.com bye y'all Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real 